I could not think of one person in my entire life that had a cold, a customer, anything. And then today I come to church and like, like dozens of people have a cold, so it must be making its way around really quickly. But for the last couple of weeks, three or four weeks, I've been really kind of talking about really that, um, that whole thing in John chapter 6 where Jesus fed the thousands and thousands of people. And then they, it's, it's very subtle. You kind of have to pick through the, the chapter to find the little scriptures. And, but they eventually at one point wanted to get fed some more because they were hungry again. Time had gone on. And Jesus started to, he, he realized that they were really following him for their own gain. They were getting healed by him. They were getting fed by him. Um, and they were, they were really, all these thousands, thousands of people were, were coming to him because they want something. And after he had given them things and healed lots and lots of people and fed them, they were still doing that. And Jesus decided to like draw the line in the sand, so to speak, and say, are you going to follow me because you want to follow me, or are you going to follow me because you get things from me? Okay? So, so he began to say some things that were very difficult for them to hear, and they all turned away. And he finally turned to his disciples and said, are you going to leave too? And they went, no, you're the only one that has the words of God. So his disciples were after God's truth and after what God wanted to do, not just what he did and what he did for them. And I just wanted to make sure that you understand that it's not that God doesn't want to do things for you. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be in relationship with you, and he wants to give you things that you need. But he wants to have a relationship with you where you follow him. He doesn't follow you. And when he went to all of his disciples, he said, come and follow me. Paul said that later on in the scripture. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. We're to follow him. And sometimes he leads us into places that are not really easy to be in. And that's where it becomes difficult and it gets challenging. And so a couple of people came up to me, you know, after, and it's like, why are your teachings always so challenging? Don't you have anything pleasant to say? Don't you have anything really encouraging to say? Something will bring real joy into my life rather than, you know, things could get tough and that's the way it is, you know. And, and um, I, I want you to turn over, if you have your cell phones, Psalm chapter 1, or an actual Bible, Psalm chapter 1. And um, I just want, to, this is, you probably know the scripture by heart. It's probably very familiar to you. This, I wrote a song to this, like, 40 years ago, it's, it's just always there, but it's just, there's so much in it that is so good that we need to um, go over something right now. It starts with, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. Okay, so this is like a really, really cool promise of God. But there's a couple things you might not really, really know about. In, in verse 1, he says, Do not walk in the counsel of the, of the wicked. The word walk there signifies actually doing something. Okay, it doesn't mean actually just believing something. You know, yeah, I believe that, but it actually means walking. It means doing something. It means work. Okay, so he's saying, blessed are those who do not do the things that sinners do or the, or the wicked do. You do not do those things. And in verse 2, it says, but delight yourself in the law of the Lord. Again, has a meaning to it in, in the Hebrew of, of more than just like, I like God's word. It's you're delighted in it. You are glad to do it in response to what the wicked are trying to tell you to do. So there's a, a physical work response to the law of the Lord as, re, as compared to the w counsel of the wicked. It's walking in his word. It's doing something. It sig signifies work. So what is the outcome if you do that? If you actually work at following God, then you're going to be like a tree with roots that are firmly planted. Now, let me just say a couple things about trees. Normally speaking, when you buy a large tract of land, let's say you're going to build a house. If you, were, um, if you were a person who really likes trees and you want some really nice trees around your house, you might go on that land and say, let's leave that one and leave that one. We'll have these two by the house. They're really nice big trees, you know, and they look really pretty. And cut the rest of them down, and then we'll build a house here. And generally speaking, contractors will tell you not to do that. 
Why? They say you'd be better off cutting those down and planting new trees. Why? Because when the storms come, when the winds come, and there's a hundred trees around, they all bear the brunt of the wind together. But when the rest of the trees are cut down, and this tree spent the last 50 years of its life growing with the help and the protection of all the trees around it, and now suddenly it has to stand in a storm by itself, its roots aren't really that deep. And it could fall and land on your brand new house. So they don't want you to do that. There was this other guy that, that I, I read about, this, this guy up in um, Norway or somewhere, and he had this, this land, and, and he wanted to plant these trees, and people said, you can't plant trees here. They won't grow here. And so he went and, and did some study, and this one guy finally said to him, here's how you're going to get it to work. You're going to have to first dig this big foundation so that the roots will have a place to grow. But he said, then, every day, you need to go out to this little seedling, and you need to, like, shake it around really hard. And he's like, what? He goes, that's what's going to make that tree put its roots down deep. And then it will be able to stand up to a storm. That's really what Jesus is telling us to do about how to follow him, how to walk in maturity. There's things in our life. When he says, follow me, the Bible says all about is like, is that we are trying to be like him, and then put it really simply, not to be complex, put it really simply, it means we need to grow up. We're immature, and there's things in our life that God wants to take us through so the winds will hit us really hard and our, root, our roots will grow deeper into him. And once that happens, then it's amazing the storms that we can, that we can walk through and have power in them. And when we have deep roots in him, then it's... We will be like this tree. We will yield fruit in its season. We, our leaf will not wither, and we will prosper in what we do. And this is not a challenging bad thing. This is what the will of God for our lives is he wants us to enjoy this life. He wants us to enjoy this life, to have a good life by being able to have roots that grow deep into him that can withstand anything. So all of the stuff that we've been paying is, yeah, it's, it's challenging to us, but it's just really like, it's just following him. It's really good stuff because he wants you to enjoy yourself. He's not calling you to a life of misery. He's calling you to a life of joy in him. It's really cool. I don't see any smiles so far, so I'm not doing any good here. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so we've been talking about all these things that make us immature, we went over a list of 11, not make us immature, things that would, symptoms of being immature, 11 of them. We went through a whole bunch of them. I'm not going to repeat them today. But I'm going to give you a list of five things you can do to really, to really, you can put into practice right now to grow up. Besides all the things that God's going to put you through, these are things you can incorporate into your life right now to start growing up. So if you have a pen, or you can have the notes in your, um, in your iPhone. You can actually open up a new note file, and you can start writing those in, right? Okay. Just want to make sure you guys are up on that. I try to encourage Linda to even make her grocery list on her iPhone, you know, because I'd say eight times out of ten we go to the grocery store. Okay, what are we getting? And she, like, starts going through her purse, and things come flying out, and she can't find the list. And we get home, and it's on the table where she left it. So, um, but that doesn't really do any good either because she leaves her phone at home a lot as well. So, she's upstairs so she can't hear me. So, I'll give everybody a dollar to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Five ways you can grow up and become his servant. His servant. I just want to remind you of the scripture. Jesus said, Jesus said, I no longer call you my slaves or my servant. I now call you my friend. Being a servant of Jesus is step one in following him. Step one. It's five ways you can, you can um, be his servant. You know, when war breaks out, there's nothing that causes a culture or a society to become more disciplined than being attacked. Suddenly, when I mean attacked in a big way, suddenly... All the men have got to go to war. And what's the first thing they do when they put a man into war? Give him a gun and say, go shoot somebody. No. Boot camp. Boot camp. When 80, 90% of what happens in boot camp is to get you to grow up. 
is to get you to learn how to toughen things up, how to put up with hardship. That's per, the number one thing. So the number one thing for us to follow Jesus is to discipline yourself. Number one thing is discipline yourself. Jesus said, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Say no to yourself. How do you do those things? I have a list. Budget. Budget's a good way of saying no to yourself. I want this. I want that. I don't feel like cooking. I want to go out to eat. It's all saying no to yourself. Budget is very, very important. I'm just going to touch on these things. Dieting. I, weeks ago, I, I noticed that for several months now that my, um, my toes are numb. So somebody said, well, you know, you drink like eight or nine cups of coffee a day. And coffee can take the B12 out of your system, which causes nerve damage. So before I even got it checked out, so I, w I went on a diet to go off of coffee. Now, I know, I know. Adam, <laughs> Adam actually said to me, I also went off ibuprofen, Advil. So Adam says, wait a minute, that's, it's coffee for you. And he said, when I think of you, I think of coffee, ibuprofen. And then I forgot what he said third. But anyway, and ducks or something. But it's a coffee and ibuprofen. So I went on a coffee diet, just had, just wanted to, and I went off of ibuprofen. And it was really, really difficult. But that's just part of discipline yourself. My toes are still numb, so I don't think that was the problem, but I'm not going back on coffee. So. so it's just part of it. The third part of that is working hard. I, I know, I know. It's like really, it's just that when I talk to people, they, they tell me about things that they need. And then they just seemed so content to just sit and watch TV on their, on, when they have time to, you know, time to do. It's working. Don't just work hard, work harder. And don't just work harder, work hardest than anybody else. Like if you need something, go and work for it. Working hard is really good for us. There was a, a young man that I knew years ago that went to, went to work at a store and, and he came to me and he said, I don't think I'm going to be any good. And, you know, I've got some of these, uh, I got some of these hangups. I don't think I'm going to be any good. And I'm, I'm like really nervous about it. I said, you're going to have no problem whatsoever if you do what, this one thing. He goes, what's that? I said, don't ever down. Just get to work. When they give you nothing to do, work, find something to do, sweep the floors, do whatever you got to do, work hard. And just started getting promoted and promoted and promoted. It's an amazing thing. It's part of what God wants us to do. You need a schedule for yourself. Another thing we can do is schedule yourself so that you accomplish things in your week that you would not have otherwise. You schedule things to, to read the Bible. You schedule to turn off the TV so you can get things done. Deny yourself. Schedule the things that you feel like God wants you to do. Put it on a schedule and do it. And do it. It doesn't mean you can't go off of that, but you're denying yourself and you're saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to discipline myself to do this. And then finally, I wrote down endure pain. Endure pain. All of these things I said above, actually, most of them cause pain. Going off a of coffee gave me a terrible headache. Going off of ibuprofen was really bad. Um, most of them cause pain. Work causes pain. You know, I, I, I met a young man one time. He goes, well, this, this hurts my shoulder. I'm like, well, if it didn't hurt your shoulder, you're not working hard enough. You know, I mean, it's, you it got to work hard. It, it causes pain. Do it. Tommy comes, comes home from hockey a few weeks ago, playing hockey. And he showed me the bruise on his hip. It was like it went from his waist down to his knee. It was a huge bruise on his hip, you know. So my initial thought was, so you're not playing hockey tonight, right? He goes, oh, no, I'm going to go play. He's just going to endure the pain because it's something he wants to do. Okay, that's number one. Number two, this is really a tough one in today's society. Be thankful. Discipline yourself to be thankful. We are a complaining bunch of brats. I'll have to say that up until, up until I joined the boat club a couple of years ago, you know, I endure a lot of complaints from a lot of different people, customers, church. But when I joined the boat club, everybody complains down there about everything. 
we are a complaining society, then nobody, has, nobody really has anything good to say. Nobody encourages anybody. Nobody says thank you to anybody. And we're the same way with God is we don't actually say thank you. Thank you, God. We have to learn thankfulness. And when I'm, when I'm saying that, I'm saying that you have to stop longing for things you don't have and be thankful for the things you do have. Pardon? Like every, every breath. Be thankful for every breath. Stop. We're always longing and thinking of the things we don't have and complaining because we don't have them instead of being thankful for what we do have. I ran into somebody very recently who was really struggling with anxiety and, and, and pressure in their life. And I said, you know, God so designed us to be in fellowship with him, to be in his presence. It, 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 like we're just supposed to be with him. And when we're with him, peace comes into our hearts. Peace comes into our hearts. So how do we be with him? Psalm 100, enter into his courts with praise and his presence with thanksgiving. You want to be with the Lord, start thanking him for the things that he's already given you. And his presence comes. Thank him for the things that it could have been worse if it wasn't for God's blessing in your life. I'm driving home from Richmond, Virginia with Linda's car. And, um, I'm, you know, so I was, I was so immature as to not do something. Her little light started flashing on her dashboard saying one of her tires is low on air. And um, I couldn't figure out which tire it was. And to her, you know, she's only got like this much room between the rim and the road. So I'm like, can't really tell if it's which one, you know. So I sp spent a lot of energy walking around the car and kicking the tires instead of getting a tool out and measuring them or doing anything like that. You know, I'm like, nah, it can't be that one, you know. Nah, that one feels okay, you know. So we drove down to Richmond, and it's about 11 o'clock at night as we're coming back up the New Jersey Turnpike. Anybody been on New Jersey Turnpike? It's a really fun road. And, um, and all of a sudden, bam, the tire just blew apart just blew apart on the New Jersey Turnpike, 11 o'clock at night. There's like barely enough room between the white line of the edge of the road and the guardrail. Tractor trailers whizzing by 75 miles an hour, even at that time of night. And I had to let Linda out of the car, like while I'm in the lane, and then so, and have her go across the guardrail and pull the car in as tight as I can. And, and, it, and I started to get angry that I had this problem at this time of night. And then God reminded me of how bad it could have been, how things could have been. And then I was thankful. And then the, the, the guy came and, and the tow guy came to replace the tire. And he changed the tire right on the spot. And I said, this is New Jersey. It's in the middle of the night on a Friday night. This is going to cost me 300 bucks. The guy charged $40. Oh, I don't know if you made a mistake or what, but I was very thankful. <laughs> yep. So it, always be thankful no matter what you're going through is how much worse it could have been. And stop longing for things. and Just get thankfulness into your heart. It puts you closer to God. It's really cool. Number three, <laughs> embrace your trials. Don't just endure them. Embrace your trial. You're going through something. You say, okay, you sent this along to me. It's mine. I want it. It's mine. It's my trial. James 1 says, consider it joy when you encounter various trials. How many of us do that? We don't do that. We start complaining. We start calling people we know. We start saying things on Facebook, and all complaints just start going everywhere. And it's really clear this isn't really a complicated thing. You don't have to go to Ben's class to figure this one out. It's pretty common. It's pretty simple. Consider it joy. Why? Knowing, it says, that the testing of your faith. Knowing. So it's not a matter of feeling the joy. It's not a matter of feeling it. It's a matter of saying, God is teaching me something. And because he's teaching it to me here, I am going to do it. And when you start to do it, your heart starts changing. It just starts changing on the inside out. 
So no more screaming, no more crying. You know, you don't have to be stupid about it like the guy in the Forrest Gump movie got on top of the mask and told God, bring it on. You know, you don't have to be stupid about it, but you embrace it. God, what are you trying to teach me in this? If this trial is from you, I want to learn what you have. I want to learn. What are you teaching me? Number four, take responsibility for your situations. Take responsibility for your situations and the things in your life. Get rid of the victim mentality and the excuse, well, I didn't bring this on, so I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Get rid of all of that stuff. Take responsibility for the situations in your life. Your health, your care, do something about it. I started having a problem. All right. I'm not going to just, you know, at, you know I, went to the, um, I went to the surgeon for my hand a few years back. And, and um, if I told you the story, I'm really sorry. But I went in there, and he's getting ready to put a needle into my finger. And I asked him if it was a, a cortical steroid or an, an anabolic steroid. And he kind of looked up at me and, and like, like, you know, started telling me about the steroid he's using and, and so forth. And I say, say a few things back because I read about medicine. And um, he goes, you know, you should be a doctor. And I said, um, I said, I don't think that would be really good for me. He goes, why not? I said, because don't, 90% of your patients, don't they just want a pill for everything to go away? Don't they just want you to give them a pill for their problems, make it go away? He goes, yeah. Yeah, they do. And I said, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't be comfortable with that. And that's what we do. We just want somebody to make our problem go away. We don't take responsibility for the problem. If coffee is my problem, I'm going to take responsibility for it. If I've got a health issue, I'm going to do something about it. You know, I'm not going to wait for somebody else to take care of it. If your actions, you're responsible for your actions. You're responsible for your reactions to things. I told you this a couple weeks ago, a guy at the bowling alley, I'm talking a mile a minute. I do that really well. I'm talking and talking, and a guy at the bowling alley on my team actually turned to me and he went, shh. So the first thing I did was I took responsibility for my action. So I'm not always good at this. This is just one of the times where I was actually good at something. And I, and I, and I said, yeah, you know what? I talk too much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet. Let this poor guy get some rest without hearing my voice. And then my reaction to what he did, instead of being mad at him, I was, I was like, okay, I deserve that. It's okay. I'm going to be okay with that. Take responsibility for what you do and take responsibility for your reactions to things that happen. God has given you an area, a sphere, it says in 1 Corinthians, a sphere that you're responsible for. You step outside that sphere and start being responsible for things outside of that, you're going to be in trouble because it's going to be outside of his grace. But inside of this sphere that he's given you, take responsibility for everything that's in it. Be a good steward of the things that he's given you, whether it be a car or children. Don't kick the tires. <laughs> Actually, you know, get it fixed. Take responsibility. Learn to change the oil. Fix an outlet in your house. Do something. Take responsibility. Last but not least, five. We need to learn and we need to grow in knowledge in the things of God. We need to learn more about him. We need to learn of God. We need to grow in understanding and wisdom of his word and of his ways. We need to do that. Being ignorant is not necessarily an excuse with God if he's given you the time and the power and the ability to grow in what he wants and his word. Take the time to do that. Being ignorant is not an excuse. Learn the difference between asking for something and then exer and exercising faith and demanding that God gives it to you. These are some of the things that you will grow in knowledge and learning when you start reading the Bible. There's a difference between saying, God, I, I'm asking you for this, or demanding for him to, to give it to you. Things of that nature are just hidden in his word. It's all over the place, and it's really great. And it's just it's one of the things for me is when I go to spend time with the Lord, I just open up my Bible, and just starts, just starts, things just start coming out. And I went, oh, that makes perfect sense now. That makes perfect sense. It's really great to do that. It's all part of growing up. 
So I just want to leave you with a thought like, I want to leave you with this major thought, this overall thing. You're here. There's a reason why you're here. There's a reason for this. It's not a happen chance. It's not just, it just showed up. God has called you. Every one of you has been called. You're not called to attend a church. You're called to follow God. And following God, you're called to make changes in your life. And when you make changes in life, he'll start pointing them out to you. Not a lot. He's not going to overwhelm you. I recently had a very, very bad bowler tell me to straighten them out. I could think of 12 things that they need to do to change. Nobody can change 12 things at once. So I just gave him one thing. That's what God does. He just starts off with, the, let's start in this area of your life. And then let's, let's go here and then let's go here. That's why you're here. Because God has a plan for your life to use you for his glory. His plan for your life isn't just to bless you. It's to use you for his glory. We're either here to grow up or we're here just to play church. So I'm just challenging you today. I told you four or five weeks ago that when one of my children was little and they had to learn how to, grow, learn how to ride a bike, they had training wheels on the bike, and then there came time and the training wheels came off. And as long as Linda was around, the child wouldn't, couldn't drive that bike because Linda screamed every time it wobbled. And she ran to hold it up for him every time. And I finally made a suggestion that maybe she could find something to do in the house. <laughs> Is it dinner time? I'm getting hungry. You want to cook something? Not that women should do all the cooking. Anyway. <laughs> Go find something to do, please. Watch TV, something. And once the child was in my hands, and I let go, and he fell. And he looked at me like I fell. I went, yeah, I know. Almost everything you do in this life, you're going to fall and get a bruise while you're learning to do it. But when you're done, you're going to know how to do it. And that's the way Jesus is really challenged us today. It's like, do you want him to sit there and hold your bike for you as you go down the road for the rest of your life? Or are you ready to take off your training wheels and follow him as he rides his bike in front of you? And that's the challenge we have before us. You either stay the way you are or you can grow up and follow him.